Welcome to this clinical update from SATNIA, the South Australian Postgraduate Medical Education Association. Today the general topic is coronary disease and our particular focus is on a supplement that was produced to the Medical Journal of Australia in April 2006. This supplement was produced under the auspices of the National Heart Foundation of Australia and the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. Co-chair of the working group was Professor Philip Aylward, who is the Director of Cardiology at the Flinders Medical Centre here in Adelaide, South Australia. We are fortunate to have Professor Aylward here today to answer some questions from our panel. Well, as you know, Chris, guidelines are becoming uh, very common in all sorts of medicine, and cardiology has really led the way. And we're often driven by what happens overseas. So there are American guidelines for most things, there are European guidelines for most things, and we thought we ought to have our own Australian guidelines, sure. uh, particularly for the environment in which we work. These current guidelines, which we produced in 2006, really update all the new information that we've received in that time, which has been significant, I yes, might sir. say pull it all together under the new title to cover these, this area, acute coronary syndromes, and try to provide a comprehensive but not overwhelming guide yeah. for the practitioner who works in this area. It's a broad spectrum we're trying to get to, but, but it's primarily, I think, physicians and cardiologists, yeah. because although we all think people practice the latest medicine, yes. and when in reality they don't, as we know when we look at that, yeah. But a very important group, I think, are country GPs and physicians who, who are a little bit isolated and may not be able to keep it up as much, but also have many, many of the patients sure. that uh, previously would never actually get to the city for the important investigations and tests they need, which is, I think, the important part of this document. Yeah. It, it's, it seems to me that, uh, that if you're in a busy general practice, it might actually find its way down to the bottom of the shelf somewhere and stay there. Uh, somehow it needs to come out in a very, um, in a very easy to understand form. In terms of simplification, I agree with you that people want to have a very simple package, which you can pick out of this if you want to. But the guidelines in general are supposed to provide at least the major evidence for why you do things and for the statements that you make, which is why it's a bit more comprehensive. These guidelines touch briefly on the importance of the response of the, the lay person when they get chest pain, yeah. though that's not a major focus of this document. It's more the medical treatment when they arrive, sure. wherever they get to. The Heart Foundation is working on a whole process of trying to educate the lay community to take the message when you get chest pain, call the ambulance and get to hospital. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting area. This is something that many Heart Foundations around the world have tried to improve, and so far no one has found a way of improving the time to presentation of individuals. Yeah. Um, for the layperson, when you have a heart attack, the average time from when your pain starts to when you receive treatment is two and a half hours. Yeah. And of that, over an hour is made up of the patient deciding whether to call the doctor or not. And often, it's two or three hours. Once you activate the ambulance, it's usually only seven or eight minutes for the ambulance to arrive, maybe 10 minutes to get to hospital, so you know, half an hour max, and then there used to be a long time waiting around the emergency department and part of this is to attack the emergency department delays which I think we've done very successfully around the country but we've never moved that one hour or more that the patient waits or you know ask the neighbour what they should do or persuades themselves it's uh, indigestion. Everyone of a reasonable age should be going to their doctor to have their risk factors assessed um, and you know they're the classical risk factors: not smoking, weight, cholesterol, um, exercise, blood pressure. The question of whether people should have the fancy scans of the heart, I think, is much more debatable, um, because in terms of treatment, it doesn't really add a lot to the um, the basic risk factor profile that you've got. In certain specific subgroups, it might. So if you've got symptoms of heart disease, so if you've got chest pain or heart failure, then you need treatment for that and you maybe need investigation. If you've got no symptoms, then usually we wouldn't treat that other than treat the risk factors, so get you to lower your cholesterol, which we do no matter what your CAT scan showed. So I think that it's a bit of debate out in the community, but I wouldn't be recommending every 50-year-old go and have a CAT scan, but I would recommend every 50-year-old goes to their GP and has their blood pressure taken and their cholesterol measured. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, have you discuss a, a segment on the uh, acute coronary syndromes, the main headline of your paper. 
And uh, as I read it, as a general physician, I detect two main subheadings, and there may be some subdivision of that, and that is the um, ST uh, elevation myocardial infarction and the non-ST elevation event. They're not totally distinguishable, as, as I understand. The first may be a false alarm, and the second may, in fact, be as, as bad an infarct as the first. Okay, well, um, when a patient presents with chest pain, yeah. the, the diagnostic test you need to do is an ECG. Right. And depending on the ECG, you then stratify people into what we call ST-segment elevation myocardial infarction or non-ST-segment okay. myocardial infarction. Well, what's this word, ST? ST segments. Now, that's part of the ECG. So when, you, when you're familiar with the ECG, that's the electrical trace you get, you know, blips. Well, there's a segment on there that when the heart's not getting enough blood, goes up in the air, essentially. And so we look at the ECG and we say, this patient's got the raised segments. That's one category that we push to one side and give a specific definitive treatment to, which I'll come back to. You then get the people who don't have ST segment elevation, and they may have a normal ECG, or they may have other changes on the ECG, classically ST depression, which is obviously the opposite to elevation, or what we call T-wave inversion, which is another change on the ECG. You then further divide, really, the, well, the whole group, but particularly the non-ST, into whether they've actually done any damage to their heart, or just, if you like, been a warning. So when you deprive the heart of blood, if it's only for 5, 10, 15 minutes, then you do no permanent damage. If it's 20 minutes or more, then the heart muscle starts to die. And that's what a heart attack is or a myocardial infarction. And there are two major things we measure these days. One is troponin, mm. which is new, and that's certainly something new since 2000. Mm. And a thing called CK, which has been around for decades. And you then can divide patients later, because you can't do this when they first arrive at the place, into whether they've had a myocardial infarction, so the title becomes non-STMI, non-ST myocardial infarction, or what we call unstable angina, which is a bad attack of pain without doing any permanent damage. So that's the broad categorization. And one of the things which we're trying to get across to doctors is the categorization can change during the process of the admission. So we're talking the patient arrives at the emergency department or the country hospital, has the ECG, and then you do go through certain procedures. Should every country doctor carry the latest fibrolytic agent? Because there are several variations of that as well, aren't there? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess that certainly every country hospital should carry pharmaceutical agents. I mean, my advice again would be, in general, for the patients to go to the hospital rather than the... So if, if a doctor is rung by a patient with chest pain, ideally I'd, I'd either get them to call an ambulance directly right. yeah. or if the, you know, we're really talking a long time for that, yeah. get one of the family members to drive them yeah. to the hospital yeah. to get them where there's a defibrillator because most country doctors do not have a defibrillator yeah. in the back of the car. However, in this... And, and during that transit period, you advise them to take an aspirin. So if you were on the phone, you'd say, take an aspirin and, yeah. and get in there. Once they get to the hospital, they need to be, the fibrinolytic drugs need to be available. Yeah. And our belief, as in the guidelines, and the, as we've discussed even locally, yeah. is they should have the latest agents, uh, yeah. one of what we call the bolus agents, where you can just give us a push, uh, an IV push. The, yeah. the older ones, you'd have to put a drip in the arm and run them in over an hour and a half, whereas yeah. now you just take a strip.